Those of you that may have uh, had the opportunity to get the full line of scalp race, you might want to maybe uh, say this race along with me. It's a full line of race, but it's also known as the wilderness race. Originally, the original version was the Worth Ranch race and was written in 1929 by Jerry Forbes. For food, for raiment, for life, for opportunity. For friendship and fellowship, we thank the old Lord. Thank you, Ben. And the leaders of the pledge and the four way test, John Adams. It's a new year, so we talk of the uh, alphabet at the end. So, and the pledge, uh, well, I always think it's ironic that John Adams is pledge. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just me. Please join me. First of all, good morning, Richard. Okay. Okay. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do you think safe? And do first when you're facing the church. Second. Is it fair to all concern? Build goodwill and better friendships. Beneficial to all concern. From leader, President, Terry Morgan. Good morning, everyone. Um, couple of announcements. Uh, we have a shorter church board meeting next week after the meeting. It's very brief. Just roll the bylaws. The pillars uh, do those bylaws so it's in their ball in order. So next week, anyone who can attend, we do cater present them so we can get those things back. Um, Your gardens coming up on August 11th and 12th. I'll be passing around the side meeting. I am in need of a pop up. A pop up is a pop up for a tent. It's probably sometime in the neighborhood of an 8x8 or a 10x10. We can have the group covered in decent rates. Um, so I, I have one and it's probably the main table up front, but I need one more. If anybody has one, we go uh, in the back. All right. So thank you, Father Joe. We're all in the back. All right. So we'll let Terry have the rest of you fill in her time. She's going to be there to, uh, to do that. She'll pull up and do the drink for you. All right. Kelly's going to be talking about the drink. Okay. The scout cabin will be dedicated on Saturday, the 19th at 10 o'clock. Everybody that will appear in front of the station. What I'm holding in mind is the original the plans that were submitted to Southern County for the cabin. And what I wanted to do was to pass these plans around so that everybody can talk about that these plans are going to go into the tax house. Area the cabin, and then we can walk back and forth. Uh, so I'm going to start with that. So here. And then just when you're done with them, just that's it. Yeah. Uh, the there, we don't know. Historical Society. The Historical Society back on the 10th and 
denied that the cabin progress was incredible. So I contacted them on Monday and asked, well, why didn't you give me the orders to do this? Well, apparently they will, they, they're not, they're not, this is not their business. This is what they do. We don't know why you didn't have over there. I did talk to them. We got the agreement. We are still on the line. So we should know by August 9th, but she said it doesn't have any tools over here. I can't have the music. So it monies will not come from the historical society. They'll still come out of the OFCC. And she feels confident that that will happen. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it, it, it's almost like one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. That's the problem that you have. So you really physically have to contact them. If you try to do this by email, you get lost. Yeah, they're, they're not real good at responding. But they will pick up a phone. No, no, this was no, and I don't, I don't, you know, Ron, I don't know specifically who they are in the state. They kind of came out of left field. Well, I don't know how we ended up there, but uh, but ultimately, their issue was that historical structures they get involved before the process starts, and I don't know. Yeah, you got me. Any other questions? All right, th thanks. Okay, um, it, Kelly, maybe I wasn't listening. Where do you want us to sign on this? Just on the back? Oh, okay. Um, from um, James, we're going to need, we believe Noah's going to be back next week. Um, yeah, no, no, we'll be back next week, but I'm not um, always available, particularly because I run out of here to go to class in Kent. Uh, so we will need one or more people to be available to learn how to do the audio visual to be a backup. Um, otherwise, we'll just have to, if for whatever reason Noah's not available and I'm not available, then we'll just not be able to have yeah, the audio visual, I guess. It would be backup if somebody wouldn't mind just learning how to do that. Oh, thank you. We have a volunteer. Rich is going to do that. Um, and again, it's just for backup when Noah can't be here. Um, yeah, and so then also- uh, Thanks, Rich. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Rich. Uh, also, uh, have a request from the people on Zoom to speak directly into that mic <laughs> so they can they can hear. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so again, the rest of this month and into next month, we're gonna be collecting for the, uh, the uh, emergency buckets for the city schools. Um, we, we've talked, talked in depth about these. So just keep that in mind, please. If everybody could could um, donate at least one bucket, that would be wonderful. And um, we've got 250 to gather. Um, I don't know what the number is so far. Marilyn's got that. Uh, but next week when she's back, we can find out where we are in that process. Okay. Okay. And John is going to introduce our speaker today. And I'm going to sign all these papers and pass them around. I'm back. All right. So please join me, Rotarians, in welcoming uh, Julie Frey to our group this morning. Let me read you a little bit about Julie's bio. So Julie is the curator at Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens. She attended the University of Dayton and the Cooperstown Graduate Program in upstate New York, where she received her MA in History and Museum Studies. Before coming back to Ohio, Julie pursued her, her museum career, first at the Rye Historical Society in New York, and then at the Litchfield Historical Society in Connecticut. She started her current position at Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens in April of 2014. As curator, Julie oversees the collections, tour services, education, and guest services departments. During her tenure, uh, with Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens, she has written six books on the history of the Sieberling family, Sieberling family, and Stan Hewitt Hall estate. She has also completed the installation of a permanent exhibition, The Sieberling Legacy, in the lower level of the Manor House and the reimagination of the Gate Lodge permit, a permanent exhibit. 
Henrietta, a spark for a movement. So please give a warm uh, rotary welcome to Julie. Thank you. Is it working? Okay, you got to do that with that. There you go. Like a game show host. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'll just wait for my presentation to be pulled up. So you can go to the first slide, please. So I'll just give some background on the Cyberlink family, talk a little bit about Goodyear history and Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens as well. So here we have the Cyberlings, um, F.A. Cyberling in business dealings, he was known as F.A., his first two initials. His full name was Frank Augustus Cyberling. His wife was Gertrude. They had seven children, six of whom lived to adulthood. So we have both a formal picture and then kind of a casual picture of the family here on this first slide. Next slide, please. Um, F.A.'s parents were John and Catherine Cyberling. Uh, he was actually born in Doylestown area. They moved to Akron when he was about five years old. His father was an inventor and an entrepreneur as well. He was involved in agricultural machinery. Before Akron became the rubber capital of the world, it produced agricultural machinery, clay tile, and um, processed oats, like the Quaker Oats Company. So his father was a very successful businessman. Next slide, please. Um, who, oh, sorry, we go to this one first. <clears throat> so F.A. was, no, you can go forward, sorry. <laughs> um, F.A. was one of nine siblings. So his parents had nine children, uh, himself and his brother, Charlie, who's in the top left corner of that group photo. And then they had seven sisters. Uh, when they moved to Akron in 1865, they purchased a house on East Market Street. It's no longer standing in downtown Akron, but it really was a gathering place for the Cyberling family. And as his himself and his nine siblings grew up, it was the epicenter of the family where they had lots of gatherings and family dinners. So you can see a casual shot there in the bottom corner. Next slide. Um, but his father owned an agricultural machinery company. You can see this 1870 map of where their home was and the factory. And it's actually one of the first places where F.A. started working and got his kind of dipped his toe into the business world and learned what it was like to be an entrepreneur, to be a business owner. Next slide. Uh, in 1903, though, there was an an economic, no, I'm sorry, in 1893, there was an economic decline, uh, a crash actually that happened and it widely affected the agricultural machinery business. And his father went bankrupt and lost his company. And so for all intents and purposes, F.A. was out of a job when he was in his mid thirties. He was married at that point. There's his wife, Gertrude, and they had four young children. And uh, so he spent the next five years from 1893 to 1898 traveling around the Midwest and appealing to farmers that had purchased agricultural machinery to please um, pay something back because that was always bought on credit. It was very expensive and was paid back over time. So he was trying to kind of recoup some of the losses his father had sustained during that financial crash and also provide for his own family. Next slide. So um, can I go to the next slide, please? So in 1898, he... Uh, bumped into a business associate in downtown Chicago who was trying to sell an abandoned factory on the east side of Akron. So F.A. struck up a conversation with this man. What are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? So they talked about this factory. And at the end of the conversation, F.A. ended up agreeing to purchase it for $13,500. So he's on the train heading back to Akron thinking, what in the world have I done? I don't have any money. He'd promised this man he'd make a $3,500 down payment within a week's time. And he also had no idea what he would produce in this factory. So as he's heading back to Akron, he's thinking about it. The first thing he does when he gets back home is to contact his brother, Charlie, um, explain what's happened. And they make the decision together, we're going to move forward with this. They borrowed the $3,500 down payment from their brother-in-law uh, so they could pay this gentleman and decided to start a rubber business. There was already a rubber company in Akron at that time, the Goodrich, the BF Goodrich Company company had been around for several decades. And F.A. really saw that there was a lot of potential in the rubber business. It was a product that was very versatile, that there seemed to be, you could do a lot of things with. 
um, bicycles and carriage tires were the main products at that time, as well as what was called mechanical goods. So these would be hoses, uh, things for the medical industry. But he also saw that there could be some creativity here, some possibility of some new invention. And he had a very creative mind. So that's what they decided to do. And they named their company, the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company after Charles Goodyear, who was an inventor from Connecticut who died in the 1860s. But he was the scientist that first vulcanized rubbers. So the company was named in his honor. Next slide. So at that point, here's a, a much older picture of um, F.A. and his brother, Charlie, sitting in the Great Hall at Goodyear. Um, they knew they needed to do two things. Competition at that time, uh, there weren't a lot of rubber companies, but it was very stiff competition uh, for those dollars out there. And the bicycle tires and carriage tires were tightly controlled by patents. So they appealed to the patent owners to try to get into the consortium so they could use that patent information to produce tires. And for all intents and purposes, they were denied. So F.A. said, well, nothing's going to stop me. So he actively started to violate those patents, but he also realized he needed to build a team that would be creative and inventive and start to um, generate patents of their own so they could produce their own products and really innovate the tire industry. Next slide. So that's exactly what they did. Here's some early Goodyear photos of the team. F.A. in the front there with the mustache and the kind of squared off hat. Um, he has about 19 patents in his name very early on. Next slide. I think I list them, yes. So here's just a handful of the ones that were really the most uh, significant for Goodyear. Uh, at the time when automobiles start to become more prolific, they start to become less of more of a wealthy person's toy and something that the everyday man can use, um, tires were very, very hard to put on and take off. You almost needed a chauffeur or a mechanic to do it for you. And tires were also fragile. They broke very easily. We didn't have paved roads in America back then. So you're on these bumpy dirt roads. You have blowouts all the time. Um, so he revolutionized the strength of a tire, its durability, um, putting tread on a tire, being able to remove it and change it, putting on and off a rim. So all those things came from the Goodyear Tire Rubber Company and are under FA's name. Next slide. The most significant thing he did though is the Cyberlink State Tire Building Machine. So this is something he started pretty early on in about um, 1903. He took his first patent out. They worked on the design for a little while and then they shelved it. They just said, ah, we, we just don't think we have the time for it. Um, but what he was realizing is that tires at that point were built by hand. So you had these tire builders that actually had to physically stretch the rubber over the tire. It was backbreaking, very physical work. The brawniest guys were the tire builders in the rubber industry. And you could only produce about five to six tires a day. And the work was inconsistent. And it really depended on the tire builder, how well a tire was made. And from builder to builder, it varied. Uh, around 1905 is when uh, Henry Ford is rolling the Model T car off of the assembly lines in Detroit, and cars are becoming much more accessible and more affordable. So F.A. recognized, I need to make tires as fast as possible. So he and an engineer at Goodyear named William State patented the Cyberlink State tire building machine, and this mechanized tire building for the first time in the industry. So here's some pictures of the machine, both kind of um, just a staged photo and then on the factory floor. So now a tire builder using this machine could make 50 to 60 tires a day. Um, and he was the first one to do it, the first one to mechanize the process. He set up a, an example uh, in a showroom in the factory at Goodyear, invited all the other tire companies from Akron to come and then franchised it. So you could uh, pay royalties, have these machines installed in your own factory and use it. And in about 10 years, about 70% of the tires produced in America were made on a Cyberlink State tire building machine. Next slide, please. So at the time he lived um, actually in a home next to his parents on East Market Street. The rectangular box down there is where the Goodyear Tired Rubber Company is located. And then his house is there with the red dot. It's no longer standing. Otherwise, um, if you're familiar with downtown Akron where East Market Street is, it's a very commercial area right now. But a hundred years ago, it was a tree-lined residential area with all these lovely Victorian homes. But as Akron grew as a city in the early part of the 20th century, um, downtown really started to encroach on that neighborhood. So people began to move out specifically to the west side of Akron and those homes started to get torn down. Next slide. So as he is becoming very, very wealthy by 1916, Goodyear 
So in less than 20 years, 1898, the company is founded 1916. It's the largest tire builder in the world. So in less than 20 years, he went from being basically a startup company in his own backyard to um, an industrial powerhouse. The family decides they want to move and build their dream home. So starting around 1910, 1911, he starts to, to purchase uh, land in what was that point Portage Township. Stan Hewitt was at one time outside of the city line of Akron. He purchases over 1,500 acres. The map here on the left shows you the original layout of the land owned by the Cyberlings. That red diagonal line is actually West Market Street, if you're kind of familiar with um, Akron. What's above that line is what is now Fairlawn Heights. Uh, the red square is what we now continue to own today. It's a little over 70 acres of land that we maintain as part of the museum property. And then this map here shows you how some of that land was divided over time. So again, he broke off a big chunk to build that Fairlawn Heights neighborhood. The green area became Sand Run Metro Park. He donated that in his lifetime in the 1920s. And then the red area stayed with the family until F.A. passed away in 1955. And then that was sold off and became residential neighborhoods that now surround Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens. Next slide. So they solicited about 20 architects and got different designs for their dream home. They decided on the Tudor Revival style and uh, hired an architect from Cleveland, a man named Charles Snyder. Uh, the first thing they did was to take a trip to England in 1912. They toured about 20 manor homes in Southern England to finalize their design, or as I like to say, copy, copy what they liked. Stan Hewitt's largely based on three of those homes, Compton, Wynne Yates, Haddon Hall, and Aquals Manor. And you can probably even see some shadows of Stan Hewitt as you look on the exterior of these three homes. They're all still standing. Haddon Hall is actually a public museum. So if you're ever in England, you can go and visit that one as well. Next slide. They broke ground in January of 1912. The family moved in December of 1915. So one month shy of being four years to complete Stan Hewitt in addition to building the manor house, they had other service buildings on the property and then doing all the landscaping. So there's our architect, Charles Snyder on the left. In the middle is Warren Manning. He was the landscape designer from Boston that was hired. And then Hugo Huber was the interior designer hired from New York City. So these three gentlemen um, didn't always play well together, but worked together to create the design. The way that they moved all of the goods to Stan Hewitt, you can see this top left photo. They actually had a railroad spur that they they built off of the line that runs on the north side of our property, um, and it brought everything up to the front door of the house on uh, train cars. So all of the bricks, the slate for the roof, as well as all of the interior decorations and everything were taken by train tracks right up to the front door. Next slide. Uh, just to show you the manor house, of course, the most impressive building um, at the museum, 64,500 square feet. Uh, 92 rooms, if you count the bathrooms and closets, some of which are room size. It's also six stories. So we have two levels of basement, which a lot of people don't realize, three levels that run the full length of the house, and then a single room on the tower. So that's that um, vertical shows you that breakdown. Next slide, please. And then as I mentioned, in addition to the manor house, they had service buildings. So starting in the bottom left corner, we have the gate lodge, which is located right inside the front gate. Um, that was originally a service building for the superintendent of the state, a domestic staff position, and that person managed all of the grounds, the gardeners, everything that happened kind of outside of the buildings. The carriage house included a 10-car garage with a car wash and a mechanic's pit for caring for vehicles, as well as a horse stable on the other side for the horses they had on property. And then on the second floor, there was apartments and housing for more domestic staff. We had our glass conservatory with the small gardener's cottage behind it. Again, more uh, living space for domestic staff. And then um, in addition to the grounds that you see, the gardens, they had a working farm behind the house on the west side, which is now our 1950s kind of residential neighborhood. Garmin Road runs down there if you're familiar. Um, but that was called Portage Path Farms. And they actually had a whole poultry farm there. Uh, dairy cows, beef cattle, and they grew a lot of products there. And all that material came to Stan Hewitt to be consumed by the family. So they were self-sustaining before that was kind of an idea back then. Next slide. Oh, so here's just to show you the gardens really quick. The um, red star is where the manor house is located. So the front gate is down here in the bottom left-hand corner. If you could just hit next. And these, the blue squares show you the formal garden spaces, which were very clustered around the manor house. Those were the entertaining spaces like the English garden, the West Terrace, the Japanese garden, and then hit, hit thank you. Uh, and these red squares show the 
more naturalistic. Warren Manning, our landscape designer, loved to work with natural native materials. He loved green space. He was not a big fan of formal gardens, but of course, Gertrude Cyberling insisted that she had to have flowers around her. But the Dell and the Lagoon area, which um, if you've been to San Hugh and are familiar with the lagoons, that's why San Hugh, it has its name. It's not the name of a person. It's one of our most frequently asked questions. San Hugh is actually old English meaning stone hewn or stone quarried. And it's named after the abandoned sandstone quarries that were on the northwest side of the property um, that had been mined in the late 19th century. So when Gertrude was looking for a name that was of the Tudor time period and how can we kind of match the architecture, she came up um, through doing some research with Stan Hewitt. Next. And then they also outside had recreation spaces. The Cyberling family was very active. They loved to ride horses, play tennis, play golf. So they actually had a four hole golf course in what's now our great meadow, our front yard. They had two ten tennis courts on property. They swam in the lagoons and went ice skating in the winter. So they also really used their property to stay healthy and recreate. Next. And then the working spaces. So you have the farm behind the property, as I talked about, the great garden, which is our gorgeous flower garden. Now it's really our showpiece was called the kitchen garden or the clipping garden because all the flowers were cut to come into the house for decorations and any food that was grown there. We have apple trees, cherry cheese, cherry and pear trees. They had strawberries, blueberries, raspberry bushes um, and other goods there all again were to come into the house for consumption. Next. So who lived at Stan Hewitt? So of course we have the family. Here's a picture taken about 1916. So just after they moved in, um, but also one of the main residents was our domestic staff. And that's some of them pictured uh, on the right in costume for the housewarming party that was held in June of 1916. They had a Shakespearean ball and everyone, including the domestic staff had to be in costume. Next slide. So we had most of the very typical positions that you would assume at a large manor home, if anyone's watched Downton Abbey, um, housekeeper, butler, houseman and housemaids, a cook, laundresses, ladies maid. And then outside we had um, chauffeurs and gardeners and groomsmen for the horses. Uh, those are pictures of our actual domestic staff. We have wonderful documentation, not only of the Cyberling family, but of the people who worked at Stan Hewitt. We've documented over 300 domestic staff that worked between 1915 and 1955. Um, we know their names, how much they were paid, what they did, how long they worked there. So it's a real treasure trove of that side of Stan Hewitt that we're able to share as well. Next slide. So one of the questions that F.A. got frequently from family and friends was, why are you building such a big house? As he was sharing the plans, talking about what was going to be included in the house, people thought, this seems like too much. Your kids are all growing up. They were all in their late teens and early 20s when Stan Hewitt was being constructed. They were, of course, going to get married, move out, have families of their own. And they said, you know, mom, dad, what do you guys could be rattling around this big house all by yourself? And F.A. said to them, I have two reasons for building Stan Hewitt. One is that I want it to be the family gathering place. He really loved how his parents' house served that function, and he wanted to duplicate that at Stan Hewitt because, again, he had those eight siblings. Most of them married, stayed in Akron, had families of their own. So he wanted to be able to always have Christmas dinner at Stan Hewitt, have big Sunday dinners. And that's exactly what they did during the 40 years they were there. Next slide. Uh, oh, so here we are. Here's some great family pictures taken in the music room. They always took a Christmas picture every year in the music room. And then they ended up having 22 grandchildren. I hadn't mentioned that yet. So uh, Stan Hewitt was always alive with children. Next slide. The other intention was inscribed over the entryway of the front door of Stan Hewitt, non nobis solum. It's a Latin saying means not for us alone. F. and Gertrude, while they had a lot of wealth when they built Stan Hewitt and they furnished it with lovely antiques that they got in England, um, they didn't collect anything and they never changed anything in Stan Hewitt from the moment they moved in. They didn't ever redecorate and they almost made no changes to the interior exterior of the home, which is good for us as a museum, very easy to interpret um, because all of their time, energy and money went back to the city of Akron. Next slide. Between 1910 and 1920, Akron was the fastest growing city in America. The population jumped from 69,000 to 209,000 people in just 10 years. And that's because of all these people moving in to get jobs in the rubber industry. There are over 30 rubber companies in Akron. I've kind of taken this Google map and plotted the addresses and the east side is where Goodyear's located, um, just to the right of 77 and Route 8. So, and you can see some pictures of some Goodyear rubber workers that dates to about 1905. And I always point out that some of them aren't wearing shoes in that picture. 
Next slide. So you have all these people flooding into Akron that want these high paying rubber jobs. And they're coming from, uh, we have migrants coming from Appalachia, Kentucky, West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania. We have immigrants traveling from overseas, African-Americans moving up from the deep South, everyone looking for that opportunity. And FA, and it really just created such a pinch point for Akron. The infrastructure was not prepared. We only had one hospital at that point with 200 beds. And now we have over 200,000 people living in town. We didn't have enough housing. The rubber uh, companies were building dormitories as fast as they could for men to sleep in. And people were also renting out literally every spare room and closet in their house. And rubber workers talk about how they would, you didn't get to rent a room that was your own. You rented a bed and you rented that bed for 12 hours. And then they re-rented it for the remaining 12 hours. So you would go to sleep and then get up, go to work. And people talked about coming home from their shifts and getting into bed. And it was still warm because the other guy had just gotten out of it. So it was a big problem. As fast as people were moving into Akron to take these jobs, a third of them were leaving because they couldn't move their families in with them. They couldn't find a house to live in. They couldn't find an apartment. And FA, from a business perspective, says, this is ridiculous because I have to keep retraining people over and over and over again. This isn't smart. Um, so that was really one of the... Um, uh, catalyst for building Goodyear Heights and Fairlawn Heights, which I'll talk about in another minute. Um, but he also, you know, built hospitals, built schools, did all of these things to make Akron successful for everyone. Next slide. So here's a list of some of the organizations that he was either a founding member of or a, a very heavy participant in. He was a founding member of People's Hospital, the second hospital built in Akron, um, help founding member of the, the Metropolitan Park Board and gave, of course, land to build Sand Run Park over 400 acres. It was the first significant park donation made in Akron. Um, very involved in several different educational institutions and some other community organizations there. He was very invested in the immigrants that were coming over. He wanted to make sure that they had a welcoming experience. So the Akron Settlement Association was a place where you could um, get started with some housing, legal advice, medical advice, laundry facilities, daycare facilities, English language classes, uh, things like that to kind of help uh, these people coming feel well welcome and feel like they knew what they were doing in this new country. He also, within the Goodyear company as well, had Americanization classes, English language classes, all these different things to help get people settled as they were coming from overseas. Next slide. But the most significant project probably was the two neighborhoods that he built. So he was involved in the construction of Goodyear Heights, phase one, and also Fairlawn Heights, which is the map on your right. So Goodyear Heights, you know, realizing this housing shortage was such a detriment to the business, approached the board of directors at Goodyear and said, well, I think that the company should set aside some funding to build this neighborhood. And they said, absolutely not. We're not interested in being involved in people's lives. That's their business. They have to figure it out. And if I said, well, that's fine, I'll just do it myself. So he had about 400 acres adjacent to the Goodyear factory that he owned that he then reached out to Warren Manning, who'd done the landscape design for Stan Hewitt and said, will you please plot out a neighborhood for me? Hired an architect from Pittsburgh. Um, his directive to that architect was he didn't want it to look like a company town. He didn't want it to be this kind of um, repeated housing design. Uh, he wanted just to look like a natural neighborhood. So the architect designed, I think it was seven or nine different houses. Uh, workers went into a lottery system. And if you were selected, you got to pick your plot and then you got to pick your house. No two houses next to each other could be the same. And they could also add features like you could add a porch, you could turn your house horizontally or vertically to make it look different. These different things to make them all unique and interesting. So when they opened up the lottery to Goodyear workers, it was overrun with interest. Of course, so that was a light bulb moment to the board of directors to say, oh, this is actually probably a really good thing. Um, so once the first lottery was complete, the Goodyear company itself decided to move forward and they paid for phase two and then later phase three as well. Uh, your mortgage could be taken directly out of your paycheck, so you didn't have to worry about it. Um, it was about five dollars uh, a week. To, uh, and then during the Great Depression, they actually worked with homeowners and gave them a discount because people weren't working a full 40 hours a week and they knew people were having financial issues. So the company actually worked with its workers to make sure that they could stay in their houses. 
and Fairlawn Heights was a neighborhood he built on the west side of Akron. And that was for more uh, white collar workers, office workers, some of the higher level uh, business people in the rubber industry. And so in that instance, again, Warren Manning laid out the land for him as well there. Uh, you could, you bought your plot of land and you could build whatever house you wanted to. You just had to get it approved to make sure that it was kind of the right kind of house. So that's why that neighborhood, there's no two houses that look the same in Fairlawn Heights. Next slide. Um, so we don't wanna leave out Gertrude. She was very involved in the community as well. She was a trained contra alto opera singer. She performed all over Northeast Ohio, kind of prior to seeing Hewitt being built as she aged, her voice changed, wasn't as strong, so she wasn't singing anymore, but very involved in musical organizations organizations, um, some other community groups, and then um, the artistic world as well. She painted for the last 14 years of her life. So was very involved with the Art Institute, founding member of the Akron Garden Club. So um, she had a more aesthetic, uh, her interests were more of a, an aesthetic nature. Next slide. So in 1921, there was a recession after World War I. One, um, everything was going gangbusters at Goodyear before then, but unfortunately the recession really threw the brakes on the company uh, to make a very long story short. That's a whole other presentation. Uh, F.A. had to step down from Goodyear during a reorganization. It was one of the caveats. He was offered a figurehead position. You can stay at Goodyear. We'll pay you a salary. You can sit in your office and kind of shake hands and, and smile for photographs, but you will have no business making decision at that point. He said, absolutely not. I'm not interested. Um, he could have during the recession sold the company, sold off the different divisions at a tremendous profit and walked away a many, many time millionaire. But he'd said very publicly, he was quoted multiple times at that point, that um, that would have put over 10,000 people out of a job in Akron. And he would never have done that if sacrificing himself was all it took to keep Goodyear going and make sure all those people were employed. That was an easy decision for him to make. Next slide. But he wasn't done yet. A lot of people, when he retired or stepped down from Goodyear in 1921, he was in his early 60s, said, oh, you know, F.A. will just kind of fade into the background. He's all done. But he took a six-month break and then reconvened with his brother, Charlie, once again. And they decided, well, we think we still have something to contribute. So they founded their second rubber company, the Cyberling Rubber Company. They bought a, uh, a rubber company in Barberton. It was the Portage Rubber Company. It had also been a victim of the 1921 recession. And they started business again at the end of 1921. The difference between the Cyberling Rubber Company and Goodyear is Goodyear had what was known as original tire business. So when a Ford, a Chevy, a Dodge rolled off the factory lines, they rolled off on Goodyear tires. All of those contracts were taken by 1921. There weren't any like really new auto companies um, being, being started. So you have had what was left was replacement tire business. So when you as a car owner needed new tires, whether you had a blowout or you just, your tires were worn out, you had to decide, am I gonna go back and buy Goodyear tires again or Firestone tires again, or should I try this new kit on the block, the Cyberling Rubber Company? So again, he was very inventive. He surrounded himself with creative people, had a lot more patents coming out. Um, they created what was called the puncture proof tire. They literally did an advertising campaign where they shot it with a bullet and then the car would drive around and show how the tire would stay inflated. Um, and they went from being the 300th rubber company um, in the nation in 1921. And in 10 years, they were the seventh largest rubber company. So he was able to build that success once again. Next slide. Uh, F.A. officially retired in 1937. Uh, his son, Penfield, who's pictured there on the right, uh, took over as president of the Cyberling Rubber Company. F.A. remained as um, chairman of the board until 1950, when he was 90 years old. And Penfield had some very funny letters in the family of Penfield being like, I wish dad would just retire. Uh, and I think he stayed around and interfered a little bit. But the uh, uh, Cyberling Rubber Company remained in family ownership until 1964, when it had somewhat of a similar fate uh, as the Goodyear uh, where there was a hostile takeover and uh, someone became the controlling stock owner of the Cyberling Rubber Company and then broke it, broke the company up and sold it off to different parts. So the tire division actually remained in business and re remained in business as Cyberling Tire, but it was then operated by the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company until about the 1990s. Next slide. So the Cyberlings remained at St. Hewitt for 40 years, 1915 to 1955. They were only family to live there. Gertrude passed away in 1946. Um, she had some heart issues and died in her sleep. And F.A. lived until 1955 when he was 95 years old. 
um, he died of pneumonia. So at that time, next slide, the six remaining children had to decide what are we gonna do with Stan Hewitt? None of them could afford to live there. Towards the end of F.A.'s life, um, you know, he wasn't of course working, making as much money, uh, having as much income coming in the house had fallen into disrepair. In some regards, all the gardens were overgrown uh, and there wasn't any kind of endowment or family money left. So they offered it to the city of Akron. The city of Akron said, no money, no thank you. They offered it to the Ohio Historical Society in Columbus as a possible kind of satellite museum. They also declined. Um, so they appealed to the Akron community and said, what should we do? What are your suggestions? And there were a group of ordinary citizens at that point that said, we'll take it. We'll form a nonprofit and we'll take care of Stan Hewitt. We think the cybering legacy is important to preserve. They've given so much to Akron. This is what we should do for them in return. So these are the siblings signing over the agreement in 1957 that transfers ownership of Stan Hewitt to what was then created as the Stan Hewitt Hall Foundation, a non-profit organization. And we've been open as a museum ever since. So I think that's my last slide. Yes. So if there's any questions, you can ask me about the presentation or anything about Stan Hewitt at all. Okay, so first of all, that was one of the best presentations on stage. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, and I've been in Akron a long time. And it's amazing how you just drive by this history in our community, and not really acknowledging the full story. Like, I didn't know that he donated Sandman Park, mm -hmm. all right? And then you drive by Goodyear Heights as you're going down to Akron Canton Airport or something, or, uh, you know, other areas of the community. And I really didn't understand how that got there mm -hmm. and why that got there. So that was really cool. So on the many tours that I've had of Stan Hewitt, um, there's, it's not been confirmed, <clears throat> but being the inventor that he is, there was a story that there was a tunnel that he could take from the home to Goodyear. Oh, I've never heard that before, but that's definitely not true. <laughs> okay, okay. So I, I, it was never been confirmed, and so I thought I'd ask you about that. But if, any, if it existed, it doesn't exist anymore, uh, but I, <laughs> that would be quite a tunnel. Got it. But again, thank you. That was a really, really fabulous presentation. You're very welcome. Any other questions? Thank you so much, everyone. Wonderful. Here, can you wait here one minute, please? We're going to have you draw for our Rota Buck. Um, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that on the history buck, though. Um, okay. So. Let's see how much we have in here today. We have $10. Jackpot is $290. So the first thing I need you to do is draw the rack. All right. Number 923740. Uh, and here he comes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, well, hey, we're getting low on marbles. You can see it in there. So go ahead. I feel look good. I well, no, I wasn't going to have it. Winner? No, no, no winner. But nice. it was a nice try. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Oh, where'd it go? That's right there. Okay. <laughs> shucks that's what i use at home too it usually works <laughs> okay thanks everybody um don't forget to sign up for the beer garden uh don't forget to sign the uh the log cabin or the boy scout cabin uh for the time capsule and I think that's it for today. Have a good week, everybody. Oh, for you tennis buffs. I know we have a whole bunch of tennis buffs out there. Today was the first day that the men's, uh, the men played at Wimbledon. It was the very first day of the opening of Wimbledon. And it was a men's, uh, uh, come on, help me out here. <laughs> yes. Uh, so just interesting facts. Have a good day, everybody. While I was doing it with my microphone in my hand.